According to the Joshua Project organization, there are about 7,278 people groups who are completely unreached by the gospel. You might think, well, that's not that many. But that 7,278 represents 3.34 billion people. 3.34 billion people completely unreached with the love of Jesus. That's 42% of the world's population have never heard of Jesus. Another 2,900 people groups have only been superficially or minimally been reached by the gospel. That's another 800 million people. 1.7 billion of them are in South Asia alone. Have never heard of the gospel of Jesus. This morning we're continuing in our Church on Mission series. And we're going to be looking at the topic of light for the nations. We're going to unpack our verse for the day, and then we're going to look at two fundamental ways in which we might be a light to the nations. But before we do that, can we pray together? should see some words come up on the screen, so let's pray this together. Spirit of truth, we thank you that you are here. Spirit of truth. Open our hearts to hear. Spirit of truth, we thank you that you are also the spirit of grace. Spirit of truth and grace, speak now, I pray. Amen. So turn with me in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 49. Whether you've got a physical version or a digital one, can I please encourage you to turn to your Bibles? We're going to be looking at quite a number of scriptures this morning, and it's, it's something that I'm very passionate about, that we open our Bibles here together, that you read those verses for yourself. We'll only put these verses up on the screen, but otherwise, can I encourage you to turn with me when I say turn, to get, look at the scripture, because it's, that's the most important part of the morning, is looking at God's word together. So Isaiah chapter 49, and we're going to read verses 1 to 6. If you'd like to stand, if you're able to, can I encourage you to stand as we read through this? I'll read for us, and feel free to follow along in your own version. Isaiah 49, verses 1 to 6. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he has spoken my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing at all. Yet what is due to me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with my God. And now the Lord says, He who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. He says, and this is our verse for the day, It is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Now, in order to understand our passage We need to rewind a few years or a few sermons 
Because a few sermons ago, Tim talked to us about God's promise, his covenant or his agreement with Abraham. Reading from Genesis chapter 12, where God speaks to Abraham and says, I will make you a nation that will be a blessing to the whole world. And so that's where we start our story is almost there with Abraham. So Abraham was to be the father of nations, which would bless nations. Abraham was the father of Isaac. And Isaac was the father of Jacob. And Jacob is called Israel. Right? Jacob was given the name Israel after he wrestled with God. And so that's where that nation and the name comes from, after Jacob wrestles with God. Now we fast forward a number of years. Moses has rescued the Israelites from Egypt. Israel have established themselves as a nation. And Israel were to establish themselves to be an example of how to live right with God and how to live right with one another. That's why all those commandments were given. They were called to stand in the gap, in that weird place between heaven and earth, essentially to represent God to the nations and to stir praise to God. That's what Israel were called to do. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 19. So Exodus is the second book of the Bible. So you go Genesis, Exodus. So right near the front, Exodus chapter 19 and verse 6. God says to the Israelite nations, he says, You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. A kingdom of priests. Of priests. What was the job of the priest? The job of the priest was to stand in that gap between God and the people. And so he's calling the Israelite nation to stand in that gap between God and people to represent God to the nations and therefore to stir the praise and the sacrifice and the worship of people up to God. How were they to be a light to the nations? Now, what's really interesting is that the Hebrew word for light is the word or. And as you can see on the screen, what is the Hebrew Bible called? The first five books of the Bible is called the Torah. There is no coincidence, and essentially that's what that means. It means the instruction. Torah means instruction. And it has within it the word light. Light and instruction are going together, hand in hand, are strongly connected. Even today, what do you say when you say, want somebody to explain something a bit clearer? What do you say to them? Can you enlighten me? Enlighten me. Or you have a great idea, you just say, oh, I just had a light bulb moment. Right? Wisdom and light have been connected. We still make that connection and we see that connection through scripture and the way that God has done this. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter two. So we're back in Isaiah, but moving to chapter two. I love these verses. This, this just The book of Isaiah is just phenomenal. Um, Isaiah chapter two, and we're reading from verses two to five. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and all nations will stream to it. Many people will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountains of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways. He will instruct us so that we we may walk in his paths. The law, the word of God, will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. 
Come and do this, Jesus. Verse 5. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Notice the parallel between verse 3 and verse 5. Verse 3 says, He will teach us His way so that we may walk in His paths. Verse 5 says, Come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. You see, even here, Isaiah is making that connection and using this word play of or and Torah, the instruction of God. Psalm 119, verse 5. If you've been a Christian for a while, you'll know this. The Lord, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You see, there's lots of connections between light and God's word and God's instruction. The instruction of God is light to us. And by living in the light of those instructions, by trusting in him who is light, we become light to those around us. The problem was, as we get to the book of Isaiah, Israel have failed miserably. Israel have failed to trust in God. They have put their trust in the nations around them. They have failed to trust in God for their provision, protection, and they have failed to be a light to the nations. Instead, they have allowed themselves to be enveloped by the darkness of the nations surrounding them. They've started worshiping the gods of those nations. They've started following the practices of those nations instead of following the instructions of God. Thank goodness that's nothing like us. We don't follow the ways of the world, do we? But as will always happen when we cease to place our trust in God and don't follow his instructions, things were not going well for Israel at all. And that brings us to our passage for the day. The section that this chapter resides in is written to Jews who were in exile. In essence, they were taken away from their country and taken to another land where they were essentially enslaved. This is the second of four, what's known as four servant songs. Songs about a servant of Yahweh who would rescue his people. Now, there were three distinct characteristics about this servant. The first, he is distinct from Israel. Second, he identifies with Israel. And third, he lives perfectly according to God's law. Does that sound like anybody that we know? Somebody who is distinct from us, identifies with us, and lived perfectly? The servant of Yahweh is indeed Jesus. And this was written 600 years before Jesus So this song is given to the Jews, is is being spoken over to the Jewish people who are living in exile. And you can imagine them listening to these words where it goes, it is too light a thing to just restore Jacob and bring back the lost ones of Israel. And there are the Jews going, yes, yes, amen to that. It's too light. Not only are we going to be restored, but God is going to crush our enemies. God is going to smash those smelly Assyrians who have treated us so badly. Yes, we're not just going to be restored, but God is going to destroy our enemies. And then to their horror, the prophecy keeps going and the song keeps going. And it says, I will also make you a light to the Gentiles that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. And the Jews going, no, 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 no. That's not what's supposed to happen. These are Gentiles, the guys who are oppressing us, the guys that are treating us so badly, they're the Gentiles. They don't need your salvation, God. We need your salvation. It's not for them. And it would just be a complete and utter shock for them. But the mission of God has always been the salvation of the whole earth. Not just a select few. 
The mission of God was always about a powerful God on a global mission looking for a committed people to partner with him on his mission. It's always about a powerful God on a global mission looking for committed people. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 25. I said we'd be doing a lot of looking at scripture. Isn't that good? Do you enjoy that? It's good to get into the Bible. Isaiah chapter 25, verse 6 to 9. I love these verses. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food. For who? For all peoples. A banquet of aged wine. Can I get an amen? Not just communion wine. (laughs) The best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples. The sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day, they will say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Amen. Isn't that good? The Lord is going to do that. It was always about the whole world. His mission was never just about one small select group of people. There was a purpose. He was just looking for committed people to help him fulfill his mission. So we know that Yahweh's servant in our passage today is Jesus. And we know that Jesus, as the passage says was called to be a light to the Gentiles as well as the Jews. So we understand that Jesus is the light of the world. So what does this verse have to do with us? Well, there's four things. The first is you'll remember a few weeks ago when we talked about care, prayer, care, share. We talked about care and we looked at Matthew chapter 5 And in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says to his disciples, he says, you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. So Jesus is pointing to his disciples and saying, you are the light of the world. Now what's also interesting when we look at the fact that light and instruction are connected, that when Jesus says to his disciples, you are the light of the world, it's within the context of the Sermon on the Mount, which is a series of instructions, light in God's word. So that's one. Turn to Acts chapter 13. We've got two more passages that we're going to turn to. So Acts chapter 13, verse 46 and 47. I also like you to turn because it gives me a moment to catch some, get some water as well. So that's a sneaky trick. Acts chapter 13, verses 46 and 47. So Paul and Barnabas answered them, them is the Jews um, of the time. He said, we had to speak the word of God to you first, but since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Paul and Barnabas are quoting Isaiah 49 verse 6, word for word. And they're saying that verse therefore isn't just for Jesus, it's for Paul and Barnabas. And actually it means it's for all of us. That we are all called to fulfill that, to be a light to the Gentiles. Now, who are the Gentiles? The Gentiles are anybody who are not Jews back in the day. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus tells his disciples, wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon you, that you may be white witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When Jesus gives the great commission at the end of Matthew, he says, make disciples of... All nations. And finally, earlier we read Exodus chapter 19, verse 6. Now turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 
1 Peter, that's near the end of the New Testament. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. Peter is now writing to both Jews and Gentiles. And he says this, he says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. He is taking exactly what God called the Jewish people to back in Exodus 19 verse 6. And he's now writing it to Jews and Gentiles. He's saying now that is for all of us, not just for Jews. So God's mission is very clearly our mission as well. We are called to be a light to the nations. So what does this mean for us? Well, I'd like you to put your hand up if any of these things are true for you. Do you work with, are in a class with, on the same street as, or regularly interact with somebody who was not born in the UK? If any of those things are true for you, put your hand up. Okay? So that's pretty much, David's laughing because he's, he interacts with himself and he wasn't born in the UK. So, uh, <laughs> um, so we all have people who are from other nations that we know that we work with, that we go to school with, that we are in class with, that we are on the same street as, that we meet in our day-to-day work life. And we have the privilege of having nations on our doorstep. We have the privilege of having nations on our doorstep. We can live out God's mission of being a light to the nations right where you are. And how do we do that? Well, of course, we do that through prayer, care, and share. But can I encourage you to be extra intentional about praying for, caring for, and sharing with people who are from other nations? Many of them are lonely and really in need of support and friendship. And you can be that to them. But also, the chances are that they are probably from nations where they're unlikely to hear the gospel of Jesus. Where preaching and saying the name of Jesus could land you in jail, could be a threat to your life, where there's just no freedom to speak the good news of Jesus. They're most likely from a nation like that. But now here they are right on your doorstep. Even for us, when we lived in India, we were in India for seven years, and the state in which we lived, and India traditionally has been very open. Our constitution says that we, it, it, you have the freedom to propagate your religion. But actually, over the last few years, there have been a number of anti-conversion laws that have been passed in India. And basically, in the state that we lived in, if anybody chose to, said they accused you or me of trying to convert them, that could land me in jail for 10 years. And I would essentially be guilty until proven innocent. They just have to accuse somebody of trying to convert them and that can land you in jail for 10 years. And that's in India, one of the more open nations, so to speak. You see, for most of us, God isn't going to ask us to be a light to the nations by going across the seas, but by going across our streets. And we have this important mission, this important calling. And the question is, are you going to reach out to your neighbor, your colleague, your classmate from a different culture? Because that is nations on your doorstep and they need to hear the good news of Jesus. What a privilege we have. What a mission we have been called to. Folks, we have a powerful God with a global mission looking for a committed people. You could also 
come and support and volunteer at the hub, the hub that we have here that runs, I think, Monday to Thursday. We have hundreds come through every week coming to, and most of them are from those nations where the gospel cannot be preached, is not preached, where it's dangerous to preach the gospel. And we have so many partners. We have Migrant Help, the ICN, and so on. And so we've got many of these people literally in this room. Most days of the week. And we are a light to the nation. So you can volunteer to to support, to help out at the hub. That's a way in which you can be a light to the nations that are on your doorstep. If you want to volunteer, find out more. Email sue at citygate.church. Last, in January alone, in January, we prayed for 20, no, not four, we prayed with 23 people. That's 23 kingdom moments, most likely with people who do not hear, have never heard the gospel before, who would not hear the gospel in their nation. 23 kingdom moments. And you can get involved with that. Maybe you want to be like Andy Watkins, who for many, many years has opened his home and his heart to international students, helping them to learn English, but more importantly, helping them to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Maybe God, some of you have a spare room and you can open your homes and host an international student for a while. There are so many language schools that are looking for host families. You get paid to be a light to the nations. Isn't that cool? So thinking about that, there are nations on our doorstep. Folks, it is too small a thing for us to be focused on our own salvation and sanctification. God is calling you to be a light to the nations on your doorstep. We have a powerful God on a global mission looking for a committed people to partner with him. How are we going to respond? Now, at the start of the preach, I talked about those statistics. I said there were 3.34 billion people who have never heard of Jesus. 3.34 billion people who do not know the joy, the strength, the peace that comes with knowing Jesus. 3.34 billion people who are unaware of the present and eternal loss of not being right with their Creator. Over the centuries, many from across the world have connected with God's global mission. Many have heard that it was too small for them just to focus on their local church, but actually wanted to respond to God's call to see salvation across the face of the earth. They saw they had a powerful God on a global mission, and they became committed people. There's a few that I want to share with you. It was one lady called Catherine Mulgrave. Catherine Mulgrave was born in 1825 in Angola. And she was taken as a slave and trafficked all the way to Jamaica as a child. Thankfully, she was rescued and she was adopted by the governor of Jamaica at the time. And so she grew up in a stable house. She grew up in the Anglican tradition And she left Jamaica and that comfort, and she went to be a missionary in Ghana at the age of 17. And she lived in Ghana for the rest of her life. She established numerous Christian girls' boarding schools and in and around Ghana, despite limited resources, much opposition, and even a failing marriage. She eventually settled in Christiansburg and she established women's Bible study groups as evangelistic endeavors. Even on her deathbed, it is said that she saw the conversion and the baptism of a houseboy from a school that she used to run. She saw that she had a powerful God on a global mission and she was a committed person. I could tell you about C.T. Studd. Some of you may have heard this name. C.T. Studd was born in 1860. Extremely privileged background. 
He was schooled in Eton, and C.T. Studd was a prolific athlete, and he was the captain of the English cricket team at the time. Sadly, his claim to fame is that they, were, they went on a tour of Australia where they lost so badly, and that's where the Ashes series came from. But besides that, he was still super privileged. He gave up all of that wealth, all of that privilege, all of that power, all of that position, and went to be a missionary to China, to Africa, and to India. He even pastored the church that I went to when I was in boarding school in India. Not at the same time, of course, I'm not that old. But C.T. Studd wrote a lot and he wrote a poem and there's a couple of lines from a poem that are really famous and very challenging and he writes this, he says, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life will, will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. I can tell you about Sundar Singh. Sundar Singh was born in India uh, in 1889 within a very strict Hindu family. He was taught the Hindu scriptures from early on. But various things happened and he came to a place when he was about 15 years old where he just found life was meaningless and he wanted to kill himself. But before he did that, the night before he had made that decision, he asked and he asked, that he said, true God, I want you to reveal yourself to me. Now, those of you who are familiar with Hinduism, you know that Hinduism has many, many, many gods. And so he's going, true God, reveal yourself to me. And that night, he had a vision of Jesus. And so he committed his life to Jesus and it cost him, it would cost him significantly. He was rejected by his father, kicked out of his father's home as a teenager at age 15. His own brother tried to poison him numerous times. In the hut that he lived, the community would often put in poisonous snakes into the hut in the hope that they would bite him and kill him. But he never gave up on his passion for Jesus. He traveled as a sadhu. Sadhu is a, a, a word for holy man. And so he kept that attire, but he didn't, instead of speaking about the Hindu scriptures and the Hindu gods, he spoke about Jesus. And he traveled to many nations. He traveled to Afghanistan, to China, to Tibet, to Japan, Malaysia, China, sharing and preaching the gospel. It, say, it's, it seems that he said something, he said this, he said, I am not worthy to follow in the steps of my Lord, but like him, I want no home, no possessions. Like him, I will belong to the road, sharing the suffering of my people, eating with those who will give me shelter and telling all men of the love of God. More recently, Jackie Pullinger, 1966, at the age of just 22, Jackie Pullinger felt the call of God to go and she had a dream of God calling her to go to Hong Kong. She had no missionary society. She wrote to many missionary societies to say, I feel God calling me to go to, to, to the ends of the earth. Will you sponsor me? Will you support me? And they were all like, you're not qualified, you're too young, no. But she felt that call so clearly that with just $10 in her pocket, she took a boat from the UK and went to Hong Kong at the age of 22. She started teaching English uh, in a primary school, but very quickly she ended up working with drug addicts from the violent triad gangs from the darkest parts of Hong Kong. These guys hooked line and sinker on cocaine and heroin and she worked and she loved them and she cared for them and she helped them break free from their addictions and one of the main ways that they were able to do that and their basically modus operandi was when you're going through withdrawal symptoms you pray in tongues just pray in tongues 
That was their solution. That was what they did. They just taught people to pray in tongues as they were going through withdrawal symptoms. The Hong Kong government recognized the incredible work that she and the charity were doing, and they actually donated a significant portion of land for her to build a rehabilitation home which houses 200 people. That work is still going on. But the missionary that has had the biggest impact on my life is a lady called Margaret Alice. Margaret Alice was from an upper middle class family. She went to, grew up in boarding school. She trained as a nurse. And at the age of 27, she left her comfortable home and her job in 1963, took a boat that took three months to get to India and went and worked as a nurse in North India. A few years later, much to the chagrin of her parents, she married a native. She married an Indian pastor, earning about two pounds a month was his salary at the time. She spent many years helping to church plant in Mumbai, in Calcutta, which is known as one of the hardest cities to plant churches. She established Bible study groups, rural education centers, and she spent 59 years serving the people of India in various ways. Now, I don't have a picture of her up on there because she's here with us, my mother, Margaret Alice Roxburgh. You see, here at CityGate, we are passionate about the call of God to be a light to the nations. Over the years, we have supported, through prayer and through finance, a number of couples. We've supported Dave and Karen. We've supported Steve and Beth. And John and Joe Lake are currently out in Zambia at the moment, back again, serving the people there. Incidentally, Joe recently put a post to say that the vehicle that they have that she was driving by herself broke down and has broken down a number of times recently. And so they're looking to buy a new vehicle that's more reliable out where they are. They can't phone the AA when they break down. They just need a friendly face or somebody to come and help. And so if you'd like to help provide some finances for them to buy a better vehicle, then please talk to Sean afterwards. I know they would value that so much. At CityGate, we're looking and we've been challenged recently in terms of being more generous in terms of being a light to the nation and giving funds, more funds, to be a light to those working out in other nations. We're looking at taking young people to other nations from CityGate so they can see that we have a powerful God on a global mission looking for committed people. We are part of commission And so money that you give goes to commission and commission contributes and supports work in countries like India, Mongolia, Bhutan, Burma, Jordan, to name a few. So the question is, how are we, you and I, going to respond to being a light to the nations? We can all go across the streets and be intentional with building relationships and having kingdom moments with people from other nations. Maybe God is stirring you to start or to increase your giving, knowing that your giving goes to support the global mission of God. Could you volunteer at the hub? Could you host an international student? And for some of you, maybe God is calling you to go across the seas. To leave the UK and go and live and work. I resisted that call for many years, but maybe this morning, as you've heard some of these stories, if you've heard God's heart for nations, maybe you're just like, actually, yeah, I need to respond. You see, folks, I'd like us to say this, slide 12, please, Hudson. Say this together. We have a powerful God on a global mission looking for a committed people. If that's you, can I ask us to stand just in closing? If you're able to, can I encourage you to stand?
if you feel stirred to recommit yourself to this global mission, to be a light to the nations, then can I ask you just to close your eyes and let's just have a quick conversation with God. What does that mean for you? Can you think of a name? Is there a person from another nation that God is putting on your heart this morning? Just to reach out to them, to try and build a relationship with them. Is God stirring your heart to give? Is God stirring your heart to volunteer? Can I just encourage you just to say, Lord, stir my heart for the nations. Stir my heart for the nations, God. And maybe, as I said, some of you are feeling a call to go across the seas, not just across the streets, but go across the seas to a nation. What does that look like for you? And I'd love for you just to after we close, just to come down and to get prayer. You may not know where you need to go, but you just know that that's what God is calling you to. And so, Lord, this morning, we just come before you. God, we recognize that you are a powerful God on a global mission. And we stand here this morning saying we want to be a committed people. We recommit ourselves to this global mission of yours. Knowing that you are with us, that you are powerful, that you would use broken vessels like us. That we might be a light to the nations, that your salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Lord, break our hearts with the fact that 3.34 billion people have never heard of you, God. And they need you, Jesus. Lord, I want to lift up every person, every missionary that is working across the world. Every missionary that has given up their comforts to go and work with people in a different culture, a different language, in difficult circumstances. Sometimes at the threat to life or separation from family. Lord, I just pray your blessing upon each one. Lord, I pray that you would provide for them in miraculous ways, Lord God. I pray that you would protect them, Lord Jesus. I pray that you would bring them people of peace that they can work with, Lord God, that your name may be glorified, Lord Jesus, in those hard-to-reach places. Lord, we thank you for couples like Dave and Karen, for Steve and Beth. We pray for John and Joe Lake even this morning. Lord, would you bless them? Would you provide for them, protect their children, Lord God? I pray for opportunities just to be a light to the nations, Lord, for specific conversations, Lord God. And Lord, I pray for every missionary that is in this room right now. Lord, I thank you that we can be missionaries right where we are. I thank you for the openness of this country to invite nations in. That we might take your nation, your salvation to the across the ends of the earth by stepping out of our doorway. And right here on our doorstep, God. Oh, stir our hearts, God. Stir our hearts for the nation, because that is your heart. That is your heart. You are a powerful God on a global mission. And we say to you this morning, we are a committed people. Amen.